We are live. Let's give it a moment. Other than the countdown, that's very anticlimactic. <laughs> it is very anticlimactic. <laughs> you know, we don't. We, we kick it off with the something. with the show video. Yeah, that's the real official kickoff. Right now is like, is it working? Did it fail? No, it's working. Okay, it's working. Tech is hard. Tech is hard. All right, here we go. I think we're live, so uh, let's give it a go. I'm gonna hit the video, and I guess I'm going full screen to me after that. Hey, it's talking about news at BHIS, and I am the guy with the mic this morning. Or this morning, man, I am. It's, it's it's tech is hard. What were we saying, Tim? Tech is hard. See you next week. That's the entire. See you, there, there we go. That's our show. See you next week. So, no, that's not the show. But uh, it is me right now because the the mighty John and the amazing Ralph are not here right now. So, I am the now senior host person. But I've got Tim with me, and I've got Ben with me, and they're the experts on hacking things and infosec things and that stuff. So I'm going to defer to them on some of the stories that we've got this week. There is some fun stories, and uh, including a, I guess, a follow-up from the big hoo-ha-ha that happened while we were on the air last week. It was the end of the facebook aftermath and then now oh now a week later we've got the story if i can bring up my screen and then go to it more details about the october 4th outage from facebook did either of you two guys read into this find anything interesting um yeah i saw it on um i guess it was on tuesday uh when they posted it um, none of it really came as a surprise to me based off of experiences that I've had and understanding kind of how their infrastructure is set up and things like that. I did find it kind of ironic at just how much of their infrastructure um, was relying on internal DNS um, and things like that, such as their badge access system. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's an audit tool failed um, and was supposed to catch what 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 commands were issued and not allow it and that's that's always kind of the worst case scenario um in, in that case is because they've got controls in place supposedly to mm -hmm. prevent this type of stuff and the control failed um and it failed in one of the most public <laughs> way possible yeah there were some pretty yeah. hilarious anecdotes going around about like I think the funniest one I saw was someone busting out an angle grinder to actually get into the the ex physically access the infrastructure that they needed to to update configs on, just because so much relied on, like you said, those internal DNS systems and you know using Facebook as a form of authentication as well. Well, and also if you look at you know they had the separation of duties and things like that, the actual you know. Uh, hands-on keyboards, people pushing configurations aren't in the data centers. They don't, they mm -hmm. may never actually step foot in a data center and they don't have access to uh, the data centers and stuff. So you had non-technical people, uh, the, what I call the rack and stack people, that they're, they don't have the authorization, yeah. uh, even though they have the physical access to the buildings and stuff. So, I mean, it definitely was a perfect storm. Uh, for them, and it'd be one of those situations that it, it'll be in a textbook for years to come, um, as you know uh, how a cascade of, I mean, a single failure cascaded just down and propagated itself through the the literally the entire company and the worldwide infrastructure. Um, I definitely, having done some uh, both data center work, DevOps work. Um, and things like that. It was, I just felt bad. Like I felt, I don't have any friends that work at Facebook that I know of. Um, but I, I felt bad for that entire organization as far as on the technical side, because they're just, they had to just be just scratching their head going, what do we do? Yeah. I mean, I, I also don't know anyone that works there, but I can't imagine that that was a fun, I don't know, 48, 72 hours of just 
first of all, trying to figure out what was going on, then how to possibly fix it. And then you know it's bad if like the final solution ends up being like physical access being required to to get to something to like either flip a switch or I mean that's like Jurassic Park level, you know, disaster really recovery was. where you gotta go downstairs and prime a prime a pump and hit a switch with raptors all around <laughs> you to get things back up online, you know. Yeah, no, and that's what I mean. That's I actually haven't heard that analogy, but that's that's about the best <laughs> I can think of it. I mean, it's just and, and the thing about it is, you know, there was engineers there that they figured out very quickly what was going on, and there was nothing they could do about it. Yeah, because like I mean, I just I ha- I was kind of joking with a friend. I was like, you got to imagine the guy that pushed that configuration. He's like, and enter went out the building to grab a smoke. And then he can't even get back into the building and it just slowly starts to set in what might've just happened. Um, you know, but it's just like, it's, I've been in a situation uh, with an infrastructure failure, not to that ex- extent or anything like that, but it's just that helplessness of I, what do you do? Yeah, no, that's, that's terrifying. I, I worked in bars in a lifetime ago and I feel like I used to have a lot of dreams about, you know, just your, being under fire at a, at a, you know, at a bar or restaurant, just unable to like deal with the onslaught of tickets and customers and tables. And I feel like having those types of dreams about like infrastructure, just dying and you not being able to like do anything about it is probably like a pretty comparable analogy that stresses me out to think about, to be honest. Yeah. Completely, completely agree. And it's, I mean, go- going from my past experience, it's just like, there's this pit in my stomach of going, I didn't even experience, you know, even like 2% of that. And it was just like, and instead of an audience of like, you know, what, 3.6 billion people, um, mine was like 200 people. Um, but even then, you know, so it's just, uh, I, I ho- obviously they, they've been able to do a root cause analysis on it. They understand what's going on. Um, I would be interested to see if, you know, if they ever come back out and go, here's some of the things that we changed, um, in the, in this process and stuff like that, because one of the concerns that I had immediately once I was aware of what was going on, um, was, you know, the fact that s- Facebook is the authentication source for so many services. And things. Yeah. And, uh, I wasn't really impacted by that. Um, but I, I never really could get a, a, a pulse on what, you know, h- how those th- services were being impacted and stuff. And, you know, imagine, if you know if if facebook can do this if they can have an issue like that what happens if something like aws mm-hmm. or azure or you know any of the microsoft services and stuff like it's just uh i think this is one of those incidents where it just shows that nobody's too big to fail oh absolutely and i think i think the the timing of it in relation to um you know those judiciary hearings about like whatever's been going on in general like i think this type of failure and like the broad reaching impact that it has really just demonstrates like how ubiquitous these services are, right? Like you're talking about using Facebook as a form of authentication and you talk about like umbrella, other umbrella companies like Instagram and like what happens to content creators that, you know, rely on tools like this for, for their own livelihood. And um, I think it makes a really strong case that it, it does appear to be like, you know, one thing goes down and the impact is just so much greater than you, you possibly could have like tabletopped or imagined it potentially being, you know? Yeah. I mean, I had some friends that uh, they are small business owners and their entire revenue stream is tied up in uh, Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. Like they have a storefront uh, presence online, but it is all the traffic, all of the uh, interaction is through these platforms. Um, And so they're like, what do we do? Like we cannot function. Um, you know, they, they're when your primary source of communicating with your customers is through Facebook messenger um, and things like that. You know, it's, it, it definitely had, was one of those things that there's going to be, I, I would hope be some interesting case studies of like, these were not all, obviously they were the unintended side effects, but like, these were the ones that just like, you didn't really even think about, but it, it actually potentially hit small people's bottom lines. Yeah, that's a good point. I, it, I think it's deeply terrifying is what it is. And like the more you rely on these big names and the more that these big tech giants gobble up 
anything that they view as some form of, of competition in the space. And then, you know, when they encounter outages, those, what could have been viable alternatives to their product or services also suffer those same outages. It kind of, I would say ultimately makes the world a slightly less secure place, but that's also probably a conversation for a different time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, on that note, on. Yeah, I was going to say on that note, we didn't really talk about the Twitch stuff last week, yeah, did that we? Happened, that happened uh, public, uh, right after the day after, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know the memes have been like October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Someone posted it in chat too, Advent Calendar of Breaches and Exposures. But um, yeah, the Twitch ones seem, seem bad too. I, people were posting like revenue payout numbers for like top content creators and streamers. Um, I think internal red team tooling got leaked from the, from the Twitch, the Twitch side of things as well as like their whole repo of source code for the application. So I think as far as the severity of potential security incidents go, the, the impact of this one is, is probably as high as it could be. Yeah. The, the biggest thing I took away from this was that I'm in the wrong industry. <laughs> um, streaming i mean i understand i have a face for radio but good lord some of the figures that these streamers are making is just absolutely insane uh but at the same time kudos to them like that's it's it's awesome that uh especially as growing up like this wasn't an option uh as, mm -hmm. as a career or anything um for for myself and, and i'm sure you as well and so for to, to see this new you know kind of uh, career path and thing I, I think is really cool but some of those numbers were just absolutely staggering um and as you and i were talking about prior to to going live was you know one of the things that stood out to me was that according to the leaks is this was part one now um it could be you know a la mel brooks style history of the world part one and there is no part two <laughs> it does you know nobody really ever that i'm aware of came out and said no password data or anything like that um was compromised and stuff and so hopefully that's not the case um because i don't think twitch has communicated to end users uh, i believe they've had communications with some of their channel partners and things like that to uh reset streaming keys and stuff like that um but yeah, you know, it's like, is there more to come? Because this is this is a, com to, in my opinion, this is a complete and utter uh, ownage uh, for Twitch to to have the source code, full commit history. Um, I, I mean, even like, what does this do for Amazon? What is it, Amazon? Um, the the Steam competitor. Um, I forgot what they called it. Um, starts with a V, but. Like that hasn't even really been announced or anything like that. Like source code for that, and like Unity libraries. Uh, it's I mean, there's so much stuff in this that it, it, I would I mean I would never go through it and all. But um, man, that's it's that's a tough day. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about pouring one out for the Facebook, you know, site reliability engineers and people to deal with that. But like, I would imagine this is this is just as bad, if not worse, right? I mean, there wasn't a denial of service scenario created with like any of Twitch's, you know, streams or anything like that. But woof. And also, you think about like, I'm sure those revenue numbers aren't nearly like full and complete pictures of, you know, whatever separate standalone sponsorship ads or you know anything like that that these streamers might have in place. So I would imagine like this is, you know, even still like a partial amount of like what that revenue looks like. Um, but yeah, a lot of interesting tools, I think, came out of that. A lot of stuff written in Go, which is kind of cool. I saw one that was like automating, um, scraping gits for like hard-coded credentials and other like cryptographic data and stuff that was kind of fascinating. So I think with the, like the implied security posture from, from the tooling that got leaked, you know, would lead me to believe that they had a pretty robust and mature security program. So seeing something like this happen, obviously just kind of makes you wonder like what's the root cause and, and how can they try and prevent it in the future? But um, I don't think we've heard anything on that front yet. Yeah, I, I don't think I have either, you know, and here again, the one thing to remember, um, even going back to the Facebook discussion, is this is an Amazon company. Mm -hmm. And and so, you you know, while people are looking at, oh, it's, you know, Twitch.tv got pwned, no, part of Amazon and, and their portfolio got owned. Um, and it just goes to show that, like, it's, 
<laughs> ben, you and I are going to have jobs for a long time. <laughs> Let's just put it that um, All of this is, uh, you know, job security and things like that. But it just it just shows how complex and how difficult it is to really secure uh, organizations at any size. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter uh, the scale. Um, it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I, people always talk about like human beings as being the weakest link in a security program. But like, I'm, I'm really kind of curious what sorts of just like the, the, the attack kill chain of this, of this breach at Twitch, like what must have happened for, you know, internal tooling and preventative controls and processes and all of these sorts of, you know, defense in depth mitigations and, you know, security functions to really just basically not matter. You know, if the entirety of your organization just has gotten dumped under the internet, it's not necessarily one or two failings, but I would, I would imagine a series of them. So that'll be interesting to see what, what that looks like at some point. Yeah. I, I do, I'm curious if they actually ever come out and say what that is. Um, Cause that's one of the, one of the tough things about this industry um, is that um unless our hand is forced by regulatory or just public pressure or things like that, we try to keep everything under, under wraps as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, you know, it's bad enough that we have to admit that we got breached and things like that publicly, but we don't want to show our hand as to where deficiencies were and things like that for, because it's embarrassing, it's egg on our face and stuff like that. But it also makes it really difficult for us to learn and improve as an industry. Um, Unless, you know, you are privy to that information, you know, I'm yeah. assuming that they had an incident response company come in, a third party, as well as their own internal stuff. And there will probably be some stuff coming out at some point in time. But how watered down, how redacted is it? Is it something that we're actually going to be able to go like, no, this is this is something that we can apply to the industry? Um, because I'm, I'm guessing you're right that it was a, a cascade. It's kind of a, a Swiss cheese in that, you know they had enough controls in place, but there just happens to be enough gaps uh, within those controls that it, things were able to trickle through and go unnoticed for, you know, for this to take place. Um, yeah. But ho hopefully we're able to learn from it. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I, I would love for uh, us to get to a point in our industry where we can go, yes, we got breached. It's unfortunate. Um, and things like that. Here's how it happened. Here's some of the steps that we've taken to mitigate this in the future and things like that. Um, but it's just not, it's not very commonplace to do that because it's, we just want to sweep it under the rug as much as possible. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I'm sure there's some sort of like heavily redacted scrubbed, you know, trade craft that'll come out at some point about what happened. And I'm sure there are probably like, you know, five eyes level threat intel sharing groups that have more of a more visibility into what played out but oh no doubt but how does that help uh you're right a lot of the organizations that we work with yeah or small mom um, and pop medium businesses and things like that that don't have the resources or the money to to be parts of those programs and i mean we've all been on those pen tests where you you feel like you're stuck for five out of six days and then like at the the 12th hour of that fifth day you find that one loophole and then it's kind of game over from there um i do kind of wonder what that looks like in an organization like this and an amazon subsidiary and like if there are lessons to be learned from that that, that could be shared amongst other similar types of companies i agree you know and uh, somebody in chat asked you know wouldn't it be better for them to say how they got breached um in my opinion yes um but i'm also not a lawyer <laughs> and uh, having dealt on the incident response side of things before, um, everything starts and ends with the lawyers. Um, yep. And so, you know, when you've got a company uh, the size of Amazon and with the resources and stuff, um, you know, they're they're going to they're not going to put anything out there that they absolutely don't have to. Um, and, and I, this is probably me being a little cynical, but if they do put something out there of, uh, oh, this is a good faith measure. Um, I'm not going to buy it um, at all. Like I, I, I think that they will, ha when it's all said and done, they will have a lot of information that they could share with the community. Um, and the lawyers are going to shut that down um, for whatever reasons. And that's fine. Um, you know, it, but it does make it difficult because, you know, I, I truly believe that I would much rather learn from someone else's mistakes than make them myself. Um, 
And so if we can prevent other organizations uh, from making that those similar mistakes, and here again, I'm just guessing, I don't, I don't have any inside information um, that, uh, you know, the one they're trying to prevent um, potentially like class action lawsuits and stuff for information. I mean, you've got, and you've got an, entire people or people's entire streaming revenue just out there publicly. Like that's their personal finances and things like that. That's, I don't know what the, the legal ramifications of that <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, you know, the other thing is you, you know, you have public, just a public trust thing. You know, I don't, I don't know that they had a mat. They're going to have a mass exodus. They, most people probably don't care. Um, the people that did care just got mad that their favorite streamers making seven figures sitting behind their computer desk or something like that. Um, and so there's a lot of jealousy, but I, like, I don't know what the justification for not sharing it is. It's just, it does tend to be a trend and, and, um, in our industry that we, we just share as little as possible. And it's, if they do share, it's going to be super redacted. Um, or, and to the point that you're not going to really be able to decipher anything, um, that we don't already know. I think a lot of it is like you said, there's the lawyers get involved and there's like a CYA mentality and there is like a public reputation that you want to uphold. But I also think that like operating under the assumption that like, it's not if you're going to get breached, it's when you're going to get breached and just having a little bit more empathy for these companies that go through these things instead of pretending like, Oh, this will never happen to us. Like, you know, our, our security maturity is so much better and stronger and our programs are more in depth and, you know, like having that empathy that this really can happen to anyone. Um, you know, that I'm glad yeah. you said that because uh, spending time on Monday, especially Monday with uh, last Monday with uh, the Facebook stuff and then following it up on Tuesday with the Twitter, uh, the, the complete lack of empathy um, within the community was kind of depressing. Um, there yeah. was definitely some vocal ones that were saying, I was like, Hey, we need to, we need to back off this. And there was a lot of jokes being made um, and things at everybody's expense, you know, dev oops. Um, but you know, having understand it, like I, I'm fortunate in my career that I have uh, been able to work on some of the incident response side. I have worked on obviously the penetration testing, red teaming side, you know, the offensive side of things like that. Um, but I've also been internal to companies and I've been privy to uh, when things go wrong um, and stuff. And so it's for me, it's like it's easy to have that empathy, that compassion going. Yeah, this yeah. really stinks. Yeah, you guys really screwed up. But that doesn't matter in this moment. The moment it, it, you know, you need to be able to recover as fast as possible, get control of the situation, and you know, and then you can uh, pick it apart, do your lessons learned, your after your root cause analysis, and things like that. Um, but having that empathy, man, it's you know, I I don't, I never enjoyed incident response when I was working in it um, because to me it was just just so stressful and. Um, everything's just, you got a hundred different people <laughs> bearing down on you all the time, um, and stuff. And so the, the people that are on these front lines and stuff, like, yeah, like it's, it's easy for us to pick them apart and being like, going, it's like, man, what a colossal failure. Can't believe this happened and stuff like that. But the reality is most organizations out there are one bad day away from having the same kind of new, news publicity. And yeah. things like that. And we don't like to look at it like that. Um, but th the reality is, as we've said, tech is hard. Tune in next week. No, but it's, you know, and security is hard. Um, there's a lot of complexities. You've got the people, the processes, the technologies, and those have to work together in a way um, that A, allows the business to operate, but B, provides the absolute most coverage possible. And it's different for every organization. And um, there's not a, you know, silver bullet uh, for information security. And, and the empathy that we can have in this community can go a long way. Oh, for sure. And I, I, I'll share like a fun personal example that's probably like pretty embarrassing. But um, a few years ago when I first started using a password manager and like arbitrary random passwords for every service and stuff like that, I'd swapped everything over. But one of the things that I didn't swap over because it just slipped through the cracks or what have you with Spotify. It might have even been that I signed up for Spotify with Facebook and then had gotten rid of my Facebook. So like it was it was harder to find a password reset fun function for Spotify. But someone hacked into my Spotify and by hacked into my, my Spotify, I mean, they just got onto it and like played a bunch of music for an hour until I realized and reset the password 
but um that's something i haven't shared with a lot of people given what we do and i was like damn they got me but uh you know it really it really does happen to everyone it can happen to everyone it, so i, it I think you're right it does i mean i you know so i guess i it's about th- i don't know about two months ago um i got an email um uh from netflix that somebody had logged into a netflix account and I'm like, well, that's odd. I don't think we've set up a new device and stuff. And then I look, and it's Malaysia. And I'm like, all right, great. Here we go. <laughs> so let's figure out what's going on. Um, re- uh, admittedly, it was not a super, super complex password. And it was one that I had shared with my family. Um, and that's why it wasn't. And sure enough, that one had – and I had knew, known that it had been um, – in a uh, a breach prior and so it you know it was netflix i didn't really care um mostly still had it for my family and things like that but you know i got the notification so i logged in netflix looked at all what they set up a, a nice guest account and i could see everything that they had looked uh, were watching and stuff like that and so in my head i'm like well i hope you enjoyed change the password secured the account move on um, but like it happens, like yeah. it's not, it's, you know, I knew, um, that that password had been compromised. Um, and I just forgot to take care of it, you know, oh, for sure. Um, you know, and it, so we have, you know, using a service like, uh, uh, have I been pwned, uh, dot com from, uh, Troy Hunt and stuff like these, we have fantastic resources, but even as security professionals, we make mistakes. Like, mm-hmm. have you ever been, have you ever been fished? <laughs> I've been getting a lot of them lately. Oh, I've got, I've been getting a ton. What's, what's funny is I've gotten some since the recent job change, um, which is interesting, but, uh, yeah, like there's uh, a few years ago, I, uh, was, I, I, I got fished. Um, they didn't, they ended up not getting anything, but it's just like the, the timing and the situation was just perfect. And I was like, you know, and as soon as it happened, I clicked the link. I'm like, this is this. <laughs> you know, done. as soon as yeah, you click like, it, like, you know. You know, it's, it, you know, instead of buyer's remorse, you have clicker's remorse. Yeah, for um, sure. And stuff like that, you know, but it happens um, because, you know, the, you're never going to remove the human element of security. Yeah. You know, we, we just have to try to um, minimize that as much as possible. Um, and also, you know, uh, understand like those things are going to happen. You need to have additional controls. If we're relying 100% on humans, mm-hmm. uh, it's, we're, we're going to have problems. And, oh, yeah. you know, so, but what else we got, Ryan? This SMS breach, I think, right, uh, Brian, I think you're muted. Is it me? No, I can hear you, Ben. Oh, I can't. We can't hear you, Ryan. No. Um, but that SMS breach was also deeply terrifying. And we were talking about like CYA language when it comes to like responsible disclosure for like security incidents. And this was just like they they disclosed that they had been breached. They had unknown attackers that had, had access to their systems for over five years or something like that, I believe. Um, and they're like, but we don't think that text messages were were tampered with or viewed or intercepted. It's like if you if you can't reasonably say, I don't know, if, if someone is in your network for five years, uh, I don't know if I trust you to say that text messages weren't weren't affected. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you know, always here again, going going back to redacted or you know everything's going through a lawyer and stuff. I always find it interesting when they say things like you know we do not believe or um, you know we don't think that inform you know certain information was obtained and stuff like that. And then you sit here and go as to your point, yeah, they were in there for five years. Like five, five years much, is a lot of time. It, it's that is a lot of time, you know, and and while. Um, it's not uncommon for these breaches to take place and then be many years long and before they are detected um, and things like that. That's just, that's, that's hard to believe that if I'm in an environment for five years, <laughs> I better have everything. I, um, I do not know at all how the, the technical stack of SMS techs work. I don't understand exactly and you know what this company does in its entirety. Um, I'm not sure how those things are, are routed, what protocols look like or anything, but I guarantee you that if I had access to that environment for five years, I would have been able to figure it out by them. 
And if not, move along. <laughs> <laughs> four four years will be my cutoff. If it, you know, if I if I'm in a network for four years and I haven't you know gotten, I mean, because other than potentially interfering, you know, playing man in the middle and actually rerouting stuff, um, which would then allow you to potentially capture uh-huh. uh, that, that data, you know, off uh, of the network there, you know, what else are you, what else are you going after in that case when that's, I mean, I don't know enough about the company and, and how they operate. Um, but it's like, it is interesting after the data. It, it's interesting to like, think of the idea of like, SMS interception at this level for for two factor or multi factor authentication, and I know we've seen a lot of stories about like SIM swapping and, and things like that. But this is kind of like the meta level of that. Um, and I think the the wisdom to take away from that is like anytime you can use some sort of hardware based multi factor, whether that's like you know Google Authenticator or YubiKey or some other like extra device or code that's not SMS based, the the more secure you're probably going to be. Agreed. You know, one of the things in reading the article that it kind of was just mulling over in my head was like, okay, so I think it says something like they had like 300 um, or something different um, operators that they routed for and things like that. So they had to um, notify each of those and stuff like that. And And it says that you know, that there's no indication that text messages or other personal information were exposed um, and things like that. But it's like, what is what is the trickle down responsibility of these disclosures? You know, let's, let's say hypothetically it comes out that uh, the data, the, the text messages and things like that were compromised. Um, you know, it's obviously they're, they've notified their operators, but how far down the chain does this trickle down to, to the consumer or does it ever, I mean, yeah, it's going to be public. So like, you know, ours and um, advice and everybody else is going to run their articles Mm -hmm. on these things. Um, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a line from the article too, that says Cineverse has notified all affected customers where contractually required. Cineverse has also concluded that no additional action, including any further customer notification is required at this time. So I would say that that does sound like bare minimum CYA disclosure as far as like letting people know what happened. So what I hear is lawyers were involved <laughs> again and you know, that, that bare minimum of what we're contractually obligated is. Yeah. They walk uh, that line. They finesse it. It it does. Well, it makes you, you know, think about it. Like how much of our lives is, is determined by the actual wording in a contract, Uh, whether it's a EULA or something else that's like, you know, no, this is the bare minimum that we have to do. And this is what we're going to do because we don't want to show our cards or, or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I think uh, Jeff McJung has said uh, we did what our lawyers told us to do is not very reassuring. Uh, um, no, it's not. Um, you know, but it's that's not going to change. It, I mean, in all fairness, I've I've never read a EULA from beginning to end, and I've signed and clicked through more than more than I can count at this point in my life. You, so, you mean you didn't spend twenty three days reading through iTunes? No, I I remember seeing that art project about someone who printed out um every word from the iTunes Eula or maybe it was the iPhone Eula or something and like bound them as a book and it was like twelve hundred so pages or something like that. Yeah, it's I uh, about the only ones that I actually read like terms of service or anything like that. Uh, I do get a joy out of reading some of the open source uh, tooling. Mm-hmm. Um, such as um, the uh, social engineering toolkit, Dave Kennedy's uh, uh, one of his projects, where it's you know you basically you owe him a beer anytime you see him. Uh, For stuff sure. like that's you know stuff like that's cool, but let's keep it under you know ten thousand lines maybe, and, and people might might be able to read it um, and things like that. But yeah, it's uh, they're never. I mean, as we said earlier, they're not going to disclose anything um, more than they have to. And that's going to be determined by the lawyers. Yeah. I mean, there's the addendum that says um, there is no guarantee that they will not uncover further evidence of exfiltration at some point. So they kind of left the, do- they left the door the open. Logs. Yeah, exactly. If you don't have the logs, you can't uncover it. So what other topics do we have? 
I briefly glanced at this this article about K-12 school cybersecurity, which is kind of interesting. Um, cybersecurity recommendations and tools for schools to use to defend themselves against hackers. I think this is kind of an interesting idea. I'm not sure if legislation always fixes things like this, but I can imagine as someone who grew up in a relatively small town outside of a larger city that the way funding works for for small municipal classrooms and school districts and things like that. I would imagine that a lot of those, there's a lot of fracture across a lot of those spaces. Um, probably not a whole lot of like required policies and frameworks that kind of are enforced universally. And I would imagine that some of those smaller schools might have less resources required to kind of really, you know, just enforce robust security. So I think any sort of approach where you're kind of trying to like get your hands around something that large, um, at least feels well intended and, and with good spirit. Um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of comes out of that. Yeah, I this is one of those initiatives that I feel like on paper, yeah, it it makes complete sense, and we definitely should be doing it. Um, you know, the ex every like everything government and everything public education, it really comes down to the execution. Oh, for um, sure. You know, Jeff makes a great point that, you know, funding is a per student. So um, I, I grew up in a fairly rural area as well um, and things like that. So we would potentially be uh, negatively impacted um, just because we don't have enough people to get the, you know, stuff. Uh, definitely being able to provide guidance and resources, I think, is something that would be uh, absolutely beneficial. Um, you know, this is a little off topic, but one of the things that I would really like to see is that uh, some kind of I don't I don't want to use control or regulation or something. But one of the things that I've had great concerns with is, in my opinion, school districts and things like that overstepping their bounds um, in terms of, you know, protecting students' privacies and things, monitoring webcams, um, things when they're not on school networks and things like that. Um, being able to provide a more comprehensive oversight and guidance on, you know, what we can do. Because if we're really looking to protect the students, that's one of the first places we have to look um, is as what what are the we doing now and what is the, you know, privacy implications for that to start with. Um, before we get to, you know, let's add more resources, more funding, more stuff like that, you know, is what we're doing now even sufficient? No, that's a good point. I mean, I think when everything first went remote last year, there were all those news stories about school Zooms getting hacked and air quotes. And I was like, was Zoom really hacked or did someone just deploy it um, without setting a password? And someone else stumbled upon it you know what i mean so i think there probably is a lot of room in between these grand sweeping gestures of like legislation and like how are they actually like being implemented on a, on a school by school basis yeah i mean you know i know and when i was growing up we had essentially one system admin for the entire district now obviously the the networks and the things like that have gotten uh, significantly more complicated and things like that. But being, you know, at the end of the day, you know, education is already resource constrained. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the solutions are, you know, techno technologically bound, are budgetary bound. Um, and so being able to implement things is, it's going to be tough, you know. Um, and, and so I, I'm all for uh, organizations, whether it's the government or things like that, being able to step in and help offer that guidance and resources and things like that. But it, it's, um, I, I don't, there again, I don't think it's going to be a one, one size fits all. And I don't think that, um, based off of history that it's actually going to be implemented in a way that's fair, um, to especially those rural schools and things like that, which, they're already typically at massive disadvantages from other aspects of educational stuff um, that if you're, you know, I look at all students fairly, look at them equally and, and try to implement it across the board. And I just think that's just going to be asking too. I mean, we've got, you got school districts that are in schools that are cutting arts and sports and things like that, just so they can keep paying their teachers um, and things like that. I don't know where security ever will fit into this discussion um, at the local level. So I, I don't know what the answer really is. 
Yeah, that's tough. And I think the attack surface is just so large. I mean, there are schools everywhere. You know, that's just like one yep. of those universal things that exists in almost every space and trying to find resources, both monetarily to be able to, to pay for those, as well as the people required to effectively maintain and implement and, and run those programs is, is definitely a stretch. Yep. Hey, Ben, do you want to talk about the gift that keeps on giving? What is it? Ransomware. <laughs> I don't think it's a news episode unless we talk about ransomware. Um, I think there's an, an article, um, Ryan, that uh, basically it kind of poses the question is, should companies be required to disclose that they paid a ransom? I mean, didn't that happen with Uber a few years ago, like four or five years ago, something like that, where they ended up paying hackers, but trying to like smuggle the payment in through something else? I, I, I probably, I, I don't remember the, the one that actually comes to mind most more recently would be Garmin. Um, I think it was last year or 2019. I think it was 2020 um, where they got breached um, and with ransomware and it shut down significant amount of their, their services and things like that. And uh, I think the ransom was upwards of, request was upwards of $10 million. Um, and then I think magically by Monday or Tuesday, all their services were back operational and things Ooh. like that. Um, you know, and so it, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, <laughs> ransomware is not going away. Um, that's, we had a discussion a few weeks ago about, um, uh, you know, governments trying to regulate like ransomware payments specifically in the crypto space and things like that. You know, I don't I, like this is a this is a complicated issue with with a lot of facets and stuff. Um, I tend to be, be of the belief the more transparency, the better. Um, but it also goes back to the same thing that we've been talking about that, you know, don't disclose anything more than you absolutely have to um, because of. If you know if you're a publicly traded company, you have certain obligations and things like that under the SEC that you may uh, need to disclose and stuff like that for your shareholders and stuff like that. Um, but small mom and pop organizations, um, law firms that get hit and stuff, you know, depending on what their contractual agreements are, uh, you know, do do you have to come out and go, "Yep, we paid," because it's it's kind of a two double headed monster there is a we got hit and b yeah we paid no, that's and a good point there's a stigma around you know there's two stigmas right now one you got hit shame on you well i think we've discussed that it's it's hard security is hard tech is hard um and b that you know you should you pay should you not pay i mean i'm of the belief that you sh if your systems have failed to the point your backup, your policies, your procedures, your disaster recovery, your business continuity, all that, let's you know put all the SISP terms out there and stuff. If you you haven't planned appropriately and you can't recover your data, you pay. Because in most cases, it's the difference of your company shutting down or you getting to keep operating. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not the best answer. I think, I think you make a really good point about like minimal amount of information being shared as possible for some of these organizations. Like, like what if there was a, a breach and ransomware involved and that, that, you know, that organization, their law team deemed that it wasn't of a sufficient impact or size or what have you to alert their customers or shareholders or whoever, and then this legislation gets passed and now they end up having to pay the ransom. And then there's like another additional lever getting, you know, forcing them to disclose that there was a breach that people may not have known about. Um, but I do think, I think you're right. I think the more of this information exists, the more transparency that's out there, the, the less of a stigma there's going to be around it. I think ideally too, the, 
the more that this information can be studied and analyzed, like the more like trends can can be drawn out of it, the more that like the transactions could potentially be traced. And, you know, these, these operating groups might have like a little bit more scrutiny and just more evidence helping, you know, lawmakers or whoever to try and figure out who's, who's doing it and how best to kind of interrupt that. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, for me, it's, there's not a, a blanket. This is the right thing for the right situations, you know? Um, if you, you know, from a ransomware perspective, most ransomware situations should A, be most likely avoidable, or B, should be able to be recovered in a uh, efficient time if you have the necessary people's process and technology in place. One of the things is, you know, having valid backups, backups that you've tested, backups that, that are offline that you know you can roll back. Yeah, you may lose a day or two or even a week's worth of data, depending on the scenario. And that could have massive financial impacts to you. Um, and, you know, so, but you still have that capability, but, you know, what do you do in the situation where, okay, we are let us our last valid backup that we can roll back to safely was a week ago and it's rolling back. We're going to lose data that's valued at $2 million for for whatever reason and the ransom's a hundred thousand dollars you pay i'm probably paying it yeah i mean i think it's it's kind of a weird space where like i don't know if it's for movies or what but you just kind of have that phrase of like never never negotiating with terrorists or hostage taker i don't know i feel like there's like this almost machismo of like oh we don't negotiate like what have you but i i think in intents and practices like i think a lot of people pay a lot of people just pay are we it's victim shaming yeah, exactly i mean that's it's it's shame on you you got you got popped okay yeah i got popped and it's it is a shame on me but it doesn't do any good to to rail on an organization for like yeah we we screwed up and we we have to pay you know uh, I'm not sure who it was in chat made a comment that's like I'd be more interested in companies having to close that they disclose that they got hit by ransomware rather than whether they paid for or not. Um, and that's a good point is like, you know, um, does it really matter that they if they paid for it or not? It's more did they get hit, you know, um, and what what could the impact of that be for me as a consumer or something like that, you know, uh, in the Garmin uh, situation? Um, I've been a, a, a avid Garmin uh, user for for their uh, triathlon watches and multi sport watches and stuff, and like we couldn't sync data for a couple of days, and uh, in our world it doesn't count unless it's on our Garmin um, and things like that. And so it, like it, it it didn't actually hurt me or anything like that, but it was just kind of funny. It's like oh, all these workouts and all these races, they just don't count because Garmin doesn't have <laughs> the data um, and stuff like that. But there are other times where you know, services go down because of ransomware and things like that, where it actually does have a uh, tangible financial impact on us as a consumers and things like that. And from that perspective, I want to know. Yeah, I don't care. I, for me, I don't care whether you pay or not. I can justify it either way. The first thing I'm going to go, you should have had backups. But pay if you have to, um, you know, because it just goes to the to the greater you know, scope of like, this is, there's not a one size fits all that, you know, yeah, you, there's, there's the list of best practices. You should be doing things. If you want to secure your organization, start with the critical security controls and, and work through those systematically and stuff. But a lot of organizations weren't built that way. They weren't built with technology and security in mind and stuff like that. And we haven't done a good job of pulling them along for this process. And so, while yes, they're responsible and they, it should have hopefully been prevented or they should be able to remediate against it pretty quickly. There again, I think we have to have a little empathy. It's okay to be critical uh, of an organization or, or something like that. But at the same time, we have to have that compassion, that empathy of going, you got to do what you got to do to, mm -hmm. um, to, re to recover. Because at the end of the day, as a consumer, especially, all I care is, can I use your service? Yeah. It doesn't matter if it costs you $10 million 
in Bitcoin or whatever <laughs> arbitrary uh, cryptocurrency that they're wanting to use. I don't care. Is, you know, you've got insurance, you've got things like that. I'm not worried about that actual monetary. It's can you continue to provide me the service that I'm paying for or that I am accustomed to using? And that's what I care more about. Um, so being able to have a situation where we're shaming companies for uh, paying the ransom, I, I kind of got to got to stop that. Um, yeah. And whether, whether they ha- they should disclose it or not, um, here again, I would prefer that they do. Transparency. We got owned. We paid for it. Right. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things that you, the more you talk about it, the more people realize that it happens all around them all the time. And it's less of this like hyper sensationalized, you know, news headline of someone getting hacked and more like just kind of a cost of doing business in a digital connected information focused world that we live in today. You know, I think another interesting point is we were kind of talking about schools and, and smaller communities lacking funding and resources and like the overlap of that with ransomware. Like you, I don't know how many like small municipalities you've seen get hit with that kind of stuff over the last couple of years, but like then it, it becomes less about like, a capitalistic service being available for for a consumer to use and more like people can't pay their electric bill for a a small town or or pay a parking ticket or something or like request permits and i think some of those implications and and impact of those services being unavailable are like probably hit much more close to home than like you know not being able to like scroll my my feed of photos or something like that you're absolutely right and having worked with municipalities of, of various types and stuff like that, looking, you know, trying to help them do the best that they can with the resources that they have, because they're, again, just like the K-12 situation stuff, they're resource constrained and all. Um, yeah, if they get hit or when they get hit, and it's going to have a, a lot more profound impact on uh, the community around them than, mm-hmm. you know, something else. You know, Garmin, I don't know how many millions of users that they have or whatever like that yeah huge inconvenience that's it like that's it yeah um and so but when you're uh you're unable to pay your power bill or your water bill or you know things get shut off because um within the you know um in the municipality, you know, we'll say all of a sudden water stops flowing and things like that. Now you start having a, not only just a quality of life, but you actually have a, uh, you know, a potentially impacts to people's health and their lives um, due to the inability to, to have the water and stuff that they necessarily need. And that's where it gets really scary. You know, um, I, it's, I, I'm, I'm concerned about every organization getting ransomware, um, and things like that, but I'm more concerned about the ones that are going to have a, a greater impact. You know, if my power company gets yeah. its owned, you even even talked about like the potential of like that impact getting crossing the line into like connect impact or you know yep. physical impact in the real world. And that's a whole other terrifying conversation for a different day. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, we've covered a lot you know, today, but there, I, if you want to summarize it in, in a few words, it's let's have empathy and, you know, let's, let's push for as much transparency as we can so that we can learn um, and not make the same mistakes over and over again, you know, um, cause that's yeah. one of the things that on the ransomware side of stuff, pretty sure most of these ransomware reports read exactly the same. Oh, for sure. I think also being humble too. I'm just like, yeah assuming that this could happen to any of us and like no one literally no one in the world is above this so no it's 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 not a matter of if it's a matter of when and we don't like to think of it that way but that's the reality of it um and you know as practitioners in this industry we have to try to uh spread the word that hey like it's (laughs) you're doing, you're doing a good job. There's always stuff that you can improve on. And we're going to try to help you identify those things um, so that you can sleep a little better at night. Um, But at the end of the day, tech is hard. Tech is, tech is impossible. Speaking of tech being hard, I think we lost Ryan to mic issues. So I think it's on, on Tim and I to close it out, but thanks for hanging with us. I'm, I'm not even sure we can close it out. Oh Yeah. 
we might just be here in purgatory for a while then. Yeah. So, so uh, this is the the pre tw- the twenty four hour <laughs> banter conathon before. So just ramp right hour. up to it. Yeah. Yeah. We are just you know we're gonna go for a solid ninety six hours into that. Um, and so no, uh, but we think thank everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, we've had a good time hanging out, and uh, we will see you next week. Bye, everybody.